Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Susie Parker. I'm a research uh, fellow here at UQCCR within the Centre for Research Excellence, um, which uh, and the Antimicrobial Optimization Group. Uh, we're delighted to have Christoph join us today uh, for a presentation. And um, but I've just start the day with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge the Yagara and uh, Turrbal people as the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. On behalf of the University of Queensland, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Um, so... Yes, today we have Christoph joining us, an Associate Professor from Ghent University, uh, and I'll just do a short bio. Um, so Christoph leads the Laboratory of Toxicology at the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences, holding both teaching and research roles, as well as leading the laboratory's service activities in forensic toxicology and reference laboratory activities. His research interests include uh, universal drug screening approaches in forensic toxicology and doping, as well as microsampling applications and the associated challenges to those. And so he's presenting today a bit of a diverse um, topic covering both of those areas, but we look forward to your presentation. Over to you, Christoph. Thank you. Thank you, Susie, for hosting me. Thank you all for, for being here. Uh, indeed, yeah, as you can deduce from the title, it's uh, quite a dual uh, title because we are really working on quite diverse uh, topics which are interrelated in, in some kind uh, of way. I'll first start off uh, with um, TDM part of what we are doing, microsampling, therapeutic drug monitoring, but also actually uh, toxicology. For those that are really not really familiar with it, I will uh, elaborate a bit on microsampling, what it is, what it does, um, applications in uh, therapeutic drug monitoring, applications in uh, toxicology, and more specifically focus on uh, a direct alcohol marker, uh, which is being referred to as a phosphatidylethanol, and then come to some conclusions of this first part. First of all, microsampling, and what's uh, microsampling? Actually, microsampling relates to the collection of a, uh, a small volume of blood, um, typically uh, following a finger prick. And um, this also already has consequences in the fact that the volume that's available is quite a low volume. If you think, for instance, about a three millimeter punch from a conventional dry blood spot fil uh, filter paper, that corresponds to only roughly three microliter of blood. Up to something like 50 microliter, we refer to a blood microsample. This also has consequences in the fact um, that taking an aliquot of a sample is not really possible. Like if you have a blood tube, you can take one part and say, okay, I'll, uh, if something goes wrong, I'll, I'll take another aliquot. And, uh, or you can also spike more easily standards into it. This is more complicated when working with a microsample. So why uh, would uh, someone be interested in uh, doing microsampling? It's actually quite simple um, because it allows you to do things, as I refer it, that otherwise are not or would hardly uh, be possible. Certainly setting up some studies, for instance, in the field of preclinical studies, uh, clinical trials, post-marketing studies, epidemiological studies, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring, Remote sampling, for instance, for toxicology purpose, on-road sampling is possible, and this can be done for a wide variety of drugs. Think of it as about therapeutic drugs, illicit and abused substances. Uh, we've also been working on vitamins and actually to do some um, uh, epidemiologically uh, epidemiological studies on vitamins, but also on biomarkers to monitor um, health, uh, as, as it's being referred to, or to monitor yeah, some really dedicated specific biomarkers that you're interested in. So many of these things um, require quite a substantial effort if you want to set it up just um, via conventional recruitment of uh, patients. And it's uh, yeah, greatly simplified if you could uh, use uh, microsampling. There's advantages and disadvantages. I won't uh, go into too much details um, on the advantages. Obviously, um, it's a small volume, uh, minimally invasive, for instance, for children, it's suited. 
um, thinking about the work uh, the, uh, the work that Susie is doing as well. There's um, ease of sampling. It's quite an economic uh, procedure. Amenable to automation. I'll come to that. Sample preparation and, and, and sample transport can be simplified. So, for instance, if you think in a remote uh, or in a country like like here, where you have quite some remote areas, it may not be so if easy to get a blood sample in a good condition from 400 kilometers away uh, to over here. With uh, dry blood, uh, it's uh, uh, it may that may not be a problem. Quite often, the stabilizing effect again there that may be quite relevant. You don't require cool sampling of uh, samples, and even um, in hot or humid uh, temperatures like you may have here, uh, it may still allow samples uh, to be to be sent without actually an impact on the analyte uh, stability. And also, if you think, for instance, about animal sampling, it conforms to um, uh, two R's of the three R's principle. So we have um, refinement, replacement, and reduction. So it's it's a refined procedure, and you have re uh, a re reduction in the number of animals that can be used because you have, can have repeated sampling from animals. Obviously, there's also some limitations, some issues uh, that you need to deal with. Uh, there's a limited amount, I already elaborated on that. There could be capillary venous differences, in other words, uh, that what you determine from a, uh, a venous blood draw or from finger prick the concentrations may be slightly different, so they cannot always use, be used interchangeably. Um, um, there could be stability issues, uh, so it's not like a magical solution that will uh, um, cope with all your stability issues. Obviously, a good result can only be obtained from a good um, uh, sample, from a properly collected sample. So if you're working on a blood smear rather than a blood spot, again, you may not get a good result. So sample quality is something which is really important and which is um, which is even more essential, which, which, uh, which should be even... Um, um, which you should pay more attention to, uh, because if it's like a remote collection, people should be trained in order to uh, collect that sample in the correct way. And then there's some specific uh, dry blood spots uh, issues. There's like recovery issues, the hematocrit effect, volume issues, spot inhomogeneity. And the key thing is actually, um, or the key uh, hurdle that was um, that has been discussed uh, in the past few years was actually the hematocrit effect. And that's um, uh, something which has been um, an issue for quite some time, and I guess we're now in some kind of way in a position that we can say we can deal with that and we can move on in order to really move the field uh, towards the next uh, step. Um, in a sense, um, those that may not be so familiar with the topic, um, and all these blood spots uh, have been generated from, uh, yeah, of by applying the same volume of blood on filter paper. Then typically in procedures that we apply, you take a sub uh, punch. So you take a punch from, from blood, dry blood spot over here. And so this implies that if you look um, over here in this sub punch, this blood has spread more than this blood. And what's the difference uh, between these uh, two blood samples? That's the hematocrits. And actually you could look at the blood as a viscous fluid. So if you, there's a low hematocrit, it's more watery. It will spread more if you apply it on filter paper. If you have blood with a high hematocrit, it's more a more viscous fluid. So it will spread less on filter paper. So then if you make a sub punch, there's less material contained in this sub punch because relative to the overall area, this is less. Um, and um, if there's more contained in this sub punch. And this uh, has implications in a way that you will have um, overestimation uh, of the concentration if you look at this sub punch, and you will have an underestimation typically of the concentration if you look in this uh, sub punch. And this could be as large as 30, 40% under or overestimation. So quite substantial from an analytical point of view. So because of these, um, um, yeah, let's say the, this entire picture, and certainly because of the advantages, microsampling is also quite often being referred to as patient-centric sampling. It puts the patient in the center. It's not like, okay, it's your problem that you have to go uh, to a hospital or to a medical doctor in order to provide your sample. It's more like, okay, we can, we will cater for you. Um, you we know you're not in the, yeah, in, in the best condition, condition, but still good enough in order to sample at home. Uh, you, you're not in a condition that you require hospitalization. And you can uh, sample at home, for instance, a dedicated time points and then send your sample to the lab and we will provide you or your treating doctor with uh, with the results and if everything is under control there's no need that you come and um, if there's like too much fluctuation you're too high or too low then you may come in and uh, for a hospital check uh, for a, um, a medical checkup Good. Um, microsampling, how is it uh, being performed? There's a wide variety of approaches that can be applied. 
Um, this is like the conventional methodology on uh, dry blot on filter paper, but there's also uh, devices uh, that have like an inbuilt capillary. This is like an old version. This is a new version that then will deposit a fixed volume um, here in, in this uh, in this case on the, on the back of the card. You can also have a pen uh, which collects here small uh, fixed volumes. Um, this are so-called um, uh, Mitra uh, tips. Uh, these are polymeric tips uh, which wick up a fixed volume of blood, in this case, 10 microliter. Um, again, a system that's based on a microcapillary uh, here that will deposit uh, 10 microliter on uh, cards uh, if you sort of Clip uh, the, uh, clip the, uh, the uh, close the device by, by clipping it. And there's not only finger prick sampling, you can also have arm sampling, uh, for instance, which is uh, relevant in the field of doping, because in basketball players, it's definitely not acceptable that you would uh, uh, do finger, pr uh, finger prick. Uh, they uh, do accept uh, arm uh, sampling. So also in the doping field, it is uh, being introduced. Several of these devices, I uh, can go back, several of these devices also um, have the advantage that they offer um, really volumetric sampling. And what you can do in that instance is that you analyze the entire uh, dry blood sample rather than a punch. And that means, for instance, um, over here, if you analyze this entire blood spot that you know, uh, this is 10 microliter. So I don't need to worry about this hematocrit effect, at least not in terms of how much is deposited on the filter paper, because if I analyze the entire spot, I know that I'm looking at 10 microliter. So it doesn't, it or it shouldn't matter if you're looking at 10 microliter of liquid blood or dry blood, 10 microliter it should be 10 microliter, that's it. Essential um, when you're doing uh, dry blood spot analysis is that the methodology is suitable. Um, there's quite uh, quite a lot of things that have been published um, where actually they just demonstrate that something can be measured uh, or can be determined in a dry blood spot, but uh, where you cannot really be um, confident about the results uh, that would be obtained. And there's several reasons uh, for that. Uh, first of all, there's several validation aspects uh, that are uh, need to be uh, need to be taken care of uh, on top of what you would do for liquid blood so, or uh, or plasma serum, um, and one of those is, for instance, the extractability. And um, this comes down to the fact that uh, an intensely dry blood spot uh, may um, may yeah may be more difficult to extract an analyte from uh, that more intensely dry blood spot than from a freshly dried spot. In other words, if you would have two spots, and actually that, that's the exact experiment that we that we do. Or, um, um, Quite early on, um, we prepare like replicate spots. One we just put um, uh, at room temperature, the other we put at 50 degrees for two days. If you would look at the one that has been stored at 50 degrees for two days, it'll be entirely brown. So it's it, because of the hemoglobin, uh, which has changed in color. And there, this is, has been really intensely dried. And then if the uh, concentration that you get from this regularly dried spots uh, versus the intensely dried spots. Uh, if the concentrations are different, uh, then that means that you have to go back to the drawing boards, change your, change, change your um, um, extraction so that you get the same result. Obviously, what I say uh, um, uh, requires that the analyte is stable, but suppose the analyte is stable, then you should really get the same result from a, a regularly dried and an intensely dried. Otherwise, we you will end up with uh, issues when you actually will apply the procedure, or you must say, you know, every sample must reach my lab in two days, uh, and I won't analyze it at day one, but I also won't analyze it at day three, and and then that makes that that takes away uh, quite a bit of the uh, convenience. So anyone that would be interested uh, would highly uh, recommend uh, reading that uh, guideline. And there's several ways, as I already said, to cope with the hematocrit issue, like volumetric sampling. Um, there's several devices. Uh, we've been lucky to be able to um, evaluate uh, several of these devices in a really uh, early stage. And in, uh, to make a long story short, um, these volumetric devices uh, effectively do what they promise to do. They do collect a volumetric uh, sample uh, in a hematocrit independent uh, way. So it is a way to get around the hematocrit uh, issue. However, um, not everyone can afford paying these devices. They come at a higher cost. And still, you may be interested in getting to a plasma concentration, because if you look, uh, think about therapeutic drug monitoring, many reference intervals are in plasma or in serum. So you still actually may, may require knowledge of the, uh, of the hematocrit in order to convert the blood to plasma concentration. Because if a blood uh, has a hematocrit of 25%, that means there's 75% plasma. 
if your blood has a hematocrit of 50%, that means there's 50% plasma. And this has like a repercussion on this blood plasma uh, conversion. So that's why we also um, coped uh, with uh, uh, that and uh, developed several procedures in order to predict the hematocrit from dry blood spots. One um, um, is actually uh, via uh, an idea that I got because we were working in, in forensic toxicology. Um, one way in, in looking at a post mortem interval, for instance, is looking in the vitreous, in the eye fluids, um, and looking at potassium uh, content. And potassium is leaked from the cells because it's primarily intracellular. So I reasoned, um, yeah, potassium is primarily intracellular. The main cellular constituent of blood are red blood cells. So perhaps the potassium content of, the, on, uh, of blood uh, reflects the uh, hematocrits. And indeed, we, de we demonstrated that uh, this, um, this is the case, and so that you can actually uh, uh, use that. This um, still requires um, some um, yeah, part of the dry blood spots to be consumed, to be used, as to say, and this is really precious material because if you only have one uh, or just, just two dry blood spots, and you have to use part of that uh, dry blood spot for a potassium determination, just to know the hematocrits, that's still not ideal because, in a sense, we're not interested in potassium. It's just a tool to get to know the, the hematocrit. That's why we all also developed um, non-contact hematocrit prediction technologies, where, in a sense, you could scan the um, uh, dry blood spots and you can still get to know the um, hematocrit. So um, we developed a procedure on uh, reflectance um, uh, spectroscopy, uh, and then also later on uh, use a near infrared based uh, hematocrit prediction um, technology. And um, also others um, have uh, done that, and in a sense, uh, comes down uh, to the fact that this works uh, quite well. This is the reflectance uh, based uh, procedure that we initially set up, was a collaboration with uh, uh, colleagues from uh, Amsterdam. So the dry blood spot card is sort of hidden over here. Then uh, you have here the spectrometer and the line, uh, light is shine uh, on, on here, and then you get to uh, know the hematocrits. This has now been incorporated into an automated dry blood spots uh, analyzer. And uh, this uh, then uh, in, in such a way allows you to uh, combine fully automated analysis of dry blood spots with hematocrit prediction. How it looks like in the instrument is actually uh, shown over here. So there's just a, yeah, a bundle of light, uh, which is um, uh, shining over here at a specific wavelength. Uh, you look at the reflectance, 589 nanometer. Um, that uh, allows to cope with uh, all different ages of um, the hemoglobin, because again, you don't want to get a different result for fresh versus old uh, spots. And um, the reflectance um, is, is just taken up again, and then you uh, get uh, the re uh, result without actually consuming parts of the dry blood spots. Uh, this just uh, illustrates that uh, the, this does work. This, this is for the um, uh, for the module that has been built in, in this uh, instrument uh, using UV-VIS or reflectance spectroscopy. We compare with the reference methodology, and we want to be uh, within uh, plus or minus five hematocrits uh, percent. And so this uh, shows that it does uh, work both for fresh uh, blood spots as for aged uh, dry blood spots. We get a, um, actually a very good uh, correlation, no bias as compared to uh, the standards, uh, the reference uh, methodology, if you look at liquid blood. Does it actually work, uh, this uh, hematocrit prediction? Can we actually uh, use it to correct uh, results? Um, yeah, for the potassium-based hematocrit prediction, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, here we look at paraxanthine, which is a metabolite of caffeine. We look at the difference here on the y-axis with whole blood. And here at the x-axis, so we look at hematocrits as reflected here by potassium uh, concentration. And you can see at the low potassium concentration or low hematocrits, we get an underestimation of the paraxanthine uh, concentration as compared to uh, uh, blood, if you look in dry blood spots, of something like up to 30, 35%. Uh, so we're really quite far off uh, for these low hematocrit uh, samples. If we know uh, what the hematocrit is, we can apply a correction algorithm. Importantly, a correction algorithm that was set up on, an, on a different set uh, of samples in order to um, correct uh, these concentrations. And then uh, you end up with something like this, so where the vast majority of the samples uh, does lie within 15%, uh, which is uh, like the analytical criterion that we apply. And so the easy thing about this is that every everyone working in a clinical lab or having access to a clinical lab can apply this because this is mentioned on a routine clinical chemistry uh, analysis. So there's no... Um, uh, let's say, no dedicated uh, equipment uh, or no fancy equipment that's needed uh, for that. 
Going again uh, to automation, uh, the fully automated drought blood spot uh, analysis, uh, the module which is built in here in this system, so actually it sits here uh, in the back. Uh, we applied that uh, on uh, tacrolimus, an immunosuppressant, for which we also set up a fully automated uh, procedure uh, with automated uh, extraction. Again, we're looking at the difference uh, between drought blood spots and whole blood here on the y-axis, and we uh, plot that here versus the hematocrit on the x-axis. Here it's a bit a different scenario, and you could say it's a bit, yeah, this doesn't fit with what I, what I said before, uh, because at low hematocrits, we don't get an underestimation, but an overestimation in dry blood spots. And this has to do with the peculiarity of the fact that we're working with automated uh, extraction, where we are less flexible in the extraction conditions that we can apply. And actually what we found out is that blood spots with a low hematocrit um, are more that, that we uh, more easily extract the immunosuppressant, tacrolimus, from those spots than uh, from blood spots with a high uh, hematocrit. So we again have some kind of a hematocrit effect, um, which is yeah, which is really related to the extractability um, from uh, from the dry blood spot. And I said, okay, the extractability is like a key thing, and we we really encountered this here, but we were sort of stuck because. In this automated system, we're really limited in what we can do. It's different from if you have an, an, just a, an extraction on the bench. And so again, we figured uh, would um, hematocrit's prediction help to cope with this uh, as well? And would it uh, allow to um, sort of bring those overestimated samples down and underestimated uh, ones up? And it uh, actually did, uh, did work. Um, just if you know the hematocrit, if you measure it in, in the blood tube, um, uh, you can correct for it and then this is what you get, so um, uh, this works. If you apply one methodology, reflectance-based, uh, then uh, this is uh, what's uh, being, uh, being built in here. Then again, we can correct these results. And if you use the near-infrared technology, which we also have in our lab, and then again, we can correct these uh, results. And again, important, these corrections are based on an other data set for which you set up a correction algorithm and then apply it on this uh, data set. And actually, um, you can uh, not only apply the, this correction algorithm for this particular immunosuppressant, you can also apply it on related immunosuppressants, um, um, serolimus, ivrolimus, cyclosporin A, they all show this uh, hematocrit dependent uh, yeah, recovery, actually, or extractability. And uh, we can all uh, correct those, either knowing uh, if you know the hematocrit, which in real time, in real life, you won't know, because if someone samples at home, you don't know, or if you measure or actually uh, predict the hematocrit using near infrared or UV vis uh, spectroscopy. So um, I already elaborated in some analytes, uh, just um, to give you some idea what can be measured in uh, dry blood spots. Uh, I always say practically everything. DNA, mRNA, um, can look at expression profiling, viral load monitoring, genotyping, proteins, um, enzyme activity is possible, antibody titers. So there's been massive studies which have been conducted in the, in the context of um, antibody titers uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in the pandemic uh, with the um, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Uh, drugs or biologicals uh, can be uh, measured, uh, biomarkers, um, look, and look and trace uh, elements, um, uh, LED, uh, met the metallic profile, we've worked on, on uh, patients having metal on metal prosthesis and actually monitored cobalt in, in those uh, patients just by a finger prick, um, potassium, uh, as I said. And then obviously in the context of what I'm talking on today, small molecules, you have endogenous compounds, therapeutic drugs, drugs of abuse, but also phenotyping, uh, looking at liver enzyme activity uh, is, uh, is possible just uh, uh, in a remote uh, context. For TDM, um, we have a multitude of applications. This is just a, a small selection of um, a drug or drug classes for which TDM has been uh, applied. Uh, we've been working on the antiepileptics, immunosuppressants, um, some um, analgesics, uh, anti-cancer drugs. Um, obviously, if you think about work uh, which is being conducted here, uh, there's uh, quite some work on antibiotics. Uh, so there's, there's really a lot, of, um, a lot of compounds that you can uh, work on. Just some selected um, applications. I don't have time to go on too many. Um, one of the um, applications that we recently have been developing is like tyrosine kinase inhibitors. These are uh, anti-cancer drugs uh, via volumetric absorptive microsampling. So these are the tips that uh, wick up a fixed uh, volume of, uh, of blood. i try to move the cursor. Yeah, uh, so the tips uh, depicted over here. Um, one of the things that we look always look at is like venous capillary differences. Like here in this instance, uh, we saw that there's no 
um, difference between venous and capillary. What you also still need to evaluate is looking at, um, do I get the same result from 10 microliter of liquid blood versus 10 microliter of, um, um, of, ven uh, of 10 microliter liquid blood versus 10 microliter of uh, dried blood? And uh, also important, if you want to convert a blood concentration to plasma uh, concentration, is that the blood plasma ratio is quite consistent. And ideally, you do that um, at the same uh, dosing uh, points. For instance, here, initially, we set up a study uh, where we uh, looked in, in in a mixture of trough levels, peak levels, intermediate levels, and we saw quite some variation in the blood plasma uh, ratio. And that obviously is then problematic, because if you have a blood concentration and you want to convert it to plasma concentration, yeah, you, you you really introduce a lot of uh, yeah a lot, um, uh, substantial error or so, uh, quite quite substantial uncertainty. Oh, we don't want that. Uh, so if we look at uh, trough uh, levels, we saw that uh, this uh, CV um, uh, is uh, substantially lower, only yeah, twelve percent, which is like acceptable. Then uh, something which is um, very important and something that we are not aware of is. Um, Typically, if we monitor a concentration, for instance, in a hospital setting, um, we consider the concentrations that we monitor as the true concentration. Uh, that's, yeah, that's really the, the concentration in that patient, and then we um, uh, modify dosing. Um, here with uh, this um, um, uh, study, we went to home sampling and actually asked the patients to uh, collect trough levels um, just when they were at home three or two days later, and again, three or two days later. So in a sense, actually, we would we would need to get exactly the same concentration, suppose that someone would be stable. Uh, but we can see that it is that's not necessarily the case. So here, this patient is quite stable. Also here are still quite close to, um, these three samples twice quite close to each other, but there's one that's further off. There's some that show, uh, yeah, quite some variability. For instance, this patient so shows Quite, quite substantial variability. Also, this patient, quite substantial variability to such an extent that you would actually have uh, or make another clinical decision uh, just based on, on, yeah, depending on what time point a, a patient would come. And actually, we really don't know what happens in these patients. So you could argue what's the value of a clinical decision based on a single point measurement uh, because someone comes to a hospital, you get to a concentration, and yeah, we don't know if that patient would come the day after, if you actually would get the same concentration. Although in theory, it's, yeah, the patient did nothing different. So we don't know what underlies this variation. It's something that we want to evaluate. Is, has it, is it related to food intake? Is it related to co-medication? Is it related to other things? Um, but this is actually, we we were surprised and not surprised. Um, we, we expected there there would be some uh, some some variability, but uh, we hadn't expected that um, uh, that would be so, so varied in, in the Way that there's quite some that apparently are really stable and some uh, apparently are really not uh, stable. And this may have um, um, biological or uh, this may have um, um, relevant uh, consequences in terms of therapy or change of therapy. Good. Um, again, uh, looking at um, um, dry blood spots for immunosuppressants, tacrolimus, um, we evaluated this uh, device and now have a study ongoing uh, with home sampling of this uh, uh, capitainer uh, device where you apply a drop of blood here and you end up with a fixed volume and then we uh, look at the entire uh, dry blood spot which has been generated and actually we see a very good concordance with um, between uh, liquid blood and um, um, uh, this uh, QDBS uh, blood uh, from this capitainer device. Uh, so in other words, also these devices are capable of um, delivering the right uh, results. Um, I do think uh, that um, for the field to move forward, uh, that we have to go to automation because at this point we show that it is feasible, that we can cope with hurdles, uh, but still clinical labs are not so keen to do um, microsampling, to incorporate microsampling in the labs. Why? Quite simple, because it takes more time, takes more staff, takes more effort to work with a microsample than with a regular blood tube. So you sort of have to get away, get away the, the human factor uh, there. So yeah, automation is, um, uh, is a possibility. So because you can increase the throughput, increase uh, safety, less hands on time, and risk, less risk on, on human mistakes. And uh, different fully automated systems have been um, uh, made available. Um, there's no commercial systems yet for the volumetric devices, like for these tips uh, that I was using or for sub punches. Uh, but there, I, there, there is um, um, 
yeah, there is movement in this field, but we're also now embarking uh, on, on that. So we already have the system on, on the right. Uh, we evaluated uh, this for antiepileptic drugs, for immunosuppressants, so already actually quite a challenging application because we're looking at uh, one nanogram per milliliter concentrations in 4.2 millimeter, yeah, it's not really punches, but flow through areas. Uh, so this corresponds to less than 10 microliter. Um, and, and yeah, we are like really at the edge of uh, where we needed the um, sensitivity. Good. Um, one example uh, that I'll talk on uh, for toxicology is uh, monitoring the biomarker uh, path of phosphodiethanol. Um, those of you that may be familiar uh, with um, alcohol, uh, shown over here. Uh, and every time you drink alcohol, um, there's something changing in your body. And one of the things that are changed is that um, some phospholipids are actually changed. And you have this ethanol moiety, which is uh, hanging over here. PEF uh, refers actually uh, to uh, phosphatyl ethanol, uh, which is the result of uh, the reaction of uh, phosphatyl choline uh, with uh, ethanol. And like that is incorporated in the membrane of red blood cells. Um, it's a, a group of phospholipids, uh, but 16O, 181 is the most abundant, and this actually refers to the length of the carbon chain. So 16 carbons or 18 carbons, the one refers to the one uh, double bond. So this is the most abundant one, and this is the one that we uh, monitor. And it gives you an idea of a uh, rough idea about the amount of alcohol that has been consumed during the past month. Really high sensitivity and specificity, and the matrix um, and that we are using, which is an advantageous if you want to work with microsampling, is blood because there's no conversion or so uh, needed. Importantly, you have to be aware, uh, or you have to be make sure that the concentration that you measure in finger prick blood is the same as in venous blood. So we did uh, that. We uh, showed that um, actually those corresponded uh, very nicely. And um, there's still even some more advantages in working with dry blood. It has an improved stability. Also, uh, no uh, formation after the sample has been uh, collected. It's also automatable um, and um, uh, yeah, also allows easy follow-up, um, uh, for instance, in the context of uh, driving license regranting. So, for instance, there's people that come to my lab uh, every four or five weeks just for a finger prick, um, which can easily be done by non-trained uh, by non-trained staff. So you don't need someone who is uh, capable of doing a vein puncture. There's a trend towards internationally accepted cutoff values. Uh, we also contributed uh, to that. Uh, in a sense, uh, below 20 nanograms per mil, uh, you're considered compatible with abstinence or low alcohol consumption. So a glass of wine uh, every every week or every two weeks uh, will still uh, give you a result below 20 nanograms per mil. Um, then social drinking or alcohol consumption between 20 and 200. And strongly suggestive of chronic excessive alcohol consumption that corresponds to roughly like six units. Uh, you also have um, uh, the 10 gram is also the unit uh, here for a unit of alcohol. I, um, I heard from other colleagues. So that means like a bottle of wine uh, per day or um, three Belgian beers, uh, because Belgian beers are stronger beers, <laughs> or, uh, or six, six regular beers, uh, but then 250 mil, um, um, and every day on a daily basis. Um, uh, in Ghent, we apply a, a cutoff of 270 also to account for measurement uncertainty in order not to be confronted with discussions like uh, someone of 200, someone with 201 is like above the limit. 199 is, oh, I'm fine. I'm a social drinker. Um, so that's why we have this uh, measurement uncertainty in order to uh, not to um, have to do to deal with those um, discussions. Good. This is um, how the procedure goes. I won't go into too much detail. Um, in a sense, for all samples, we uh, generate dry blood spots, um, whether directly from the fingertip or whether we get whole blood. So we also uh, prepare it. We demonstrate its uh, equivalence between uh, both, and it's uh, with an LCM SMS procedure after uh, having been having performed a liquid liquids uh, extraction. Uh, there's quite some um, quite some yeah, details that are really important to do it in the right way. Um, so we now perform that uh, under full accreditation. We participate to proficiency tests and so on. Uh, and um, certainly the um, uh, supplementary information is actually quite relevant because we we, yeah, we dealt with quite some, some issues. We also compared with, a, with another lab in order to get to compar comparable results. And uh, everything is um, uh, detailed in, the, uh, in this paper and its supplementary information. Um, we did a population study in order to um, know uh, how the decline was uh, in path. Uh, so if, if I would monitor each one of you, uh, and I would have your insight in your path level today, and then you would remain abstinent for 
a couple of weeks, and then I can predict where you'll be in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, and thus, this is relevant because some people present uh, with a relatively high level and remain abstinent, and then will still be positive uh, for this path marker, marker. So if you only would then look at the at uh, at this uh, at, a, at the result at a given point in time, you would say, "Ah, oh, you're positive, so you have been drinking." And they would say, "No, actually, I've been abstinent for four weeks." And then you can really prove that they have been abstinent. Uh, but obviously, you need to be aware of this decline. So that's why we set up a population study. And in a sense, uh, what we did was uh, we just you know, via Ghent University. Um, via some social media, um, uh, recruited uh, participants that normally do drink alcohol and then refrain from uh, drinking alcohol for uh, quite some time, for, for a month. Um, how do you set up such a study? We probably think about how do, yeah, how do you find these persons that normally do drink and just voluntarily will stop uh, drinking for, uh, for a month? It's like um, hooking up with an initiative that you also have here, like Dry in July. Uh, we have something similar in, uh, in Belgium uh, that it's called Tournée Mineral. So if you enter a pub and like give a round, it's like Tournée Général, it's like a French word. And it's like uh, giving a, a general round, but rather uh, than with beer, it's with water, it's mineral water. Uh, so um, it's in the month of February. Obviously, we're from Belgium. If you have to choose one month, then you choose the, the shortest uh, month. Yeah. And actually, uh, what these um, individuals had to do was they had to sample uh, early February, mid and then the February, so they had been drinking in January uh, because that was like um, a, a requirement. And uh, then we had an initial value um, and uh, then we saw the decline in these individuals. These individuals are motivated uh, to, yeah, to remain abstinent because and even more motivated probably because they really wanted to get insight into how is this dry in July? How is this Tuni Mineral affecting my body? How is it affecting my biomarkers? So we did need to pay them. And actually, we could really put the incentive with them. You want to get insight into how your uh, alcohol biomarker moves. So you better make sure that you get the sampling with this uh, Mitra's um, uh, uh, volumetric absorptive microsampling tips uh, right. So this um, was really good because with the success rate of, um, let's say, good sampling was 92% of the individuals that um, could um, uh, perform the sampling in a correct way. Everything was done remote, remotely because it would be impossible to have 800 individuals come beginning February, mid-February, 800 uh, and end of February. Everything was just done remotely. We sent samples um, and there was a, a YouTube video. So we really made sure that they were properly informed and it worked. In the end, to make a long story short, what could we do uh, with that? Um, so we could, have, we could set up a prediction interval and 95% uh, confidence uh, pre with prediction, uh, taking into account all different variables in the population. Uh, we had here like a relative starting situation, and then we can predict where someone is. So for instance, if uh, someone who has a starting value here ends up after a certain uh, period of time over here, then we can definitely say you have been drinking, you've not been, uh, been abstinent. And so this does work. We already got feedback from several individuals that said, uh, like one uh, said, no, I've, I've I have been abstinent um, since um, um, uh, I've been abstinent, and so it yeah it it doesn't doesn't match uh, with um, and I said yeah probably we are, yeah I can believe that you you have uh, you have been abstinent because she claims she was on, on disulfiram uh, so anti um, uh, which is um, uh, the medication that makes you feel bad if you drink alcohol and I said yeah I I, I do believe that you're that you're abstinent but probably you only be uh, you only uh, became abstinent after you got back your result from the sampling and then um, and that would explain why you're still Still end up too high and then she said oh, actually yes indeed it was like that because we report back quite fast within a week uh, we report back to these individuals and then they change behavior that's sometimes what we see because it's like oh i'm so high and it, it yeah so we, i do have a problem it confronts them with that and it does change uh, it, yeah it, it doesn't use a change good uh, so to conclude this first part and um, dry blood sampling or general uh, um, uh, dry blood micro sampling uh, has evolved a lot since the establishment of newborn screening, where it actually all started. Um, it offers a wide, quite a wide variety of advantages. Validation may require a substantial extra effort. We've done um, uh, quite some uh, so quite some work in in that space. Then um, there's a wide variety of approaches that has been developed the past few uh, years. It's increasingly being used in uh, um, both in TDM and in toxicology. Important steps have been taken towards implementation in routine. 
we run several accredited uh, accredited procedures uh, in our lab uh, for, uh, for instance, for GHB uh, related to toxicology and, and PEF. And like last year, we've done several thousands of analysis on these uh, uh, PEF in uh, micro samples. So we get samples even from uh, from the UK, uh, which are sent to us on a weekly basis uh, for uh, for analysis, uh, which is quite convenient because there's no dedicated trans sample transport. It's just regular FedEx package that we uh, that we get uh, with these dried blood micro samples. We do need more real life data as well as the studies demonstrating the clinical and or financial benefits. And with that, I mean, um, if you have better patient follow-up, and I refer to this variation in concentrations that we saw, for instance, with this tyrosine kinase inhibitor, this may be relevant. And actually just um, avoiding one or even just a few hospitalizations can be really beneficial. Certainly also if you think, for instance, the context um, in, of work that's being performed here, if you work on antibiotics and you would have um, home sampling from, um, uh, yeah, you would have home sampling, just avoiding some yeah, uh, some hospitalizations can um, uh, can already um, yeah be quite cost beneficial uh, from from society perspective from um, um, uh, because one hospitalization costs an immense amount of money whereas uh, yeah this monitoring is relatively uh, cheap or can be done relatively cheap. Good, let's uh, switch gears. Um, more or less on time, uh, and go to the second uh, part, uh, bioassays for uh, forensic uh, toxicology and utility of those. Again, um, I'll briefly uh, introduce um, how we got there, um, assay principle and protocol, um, what the applications is that we are uh, running, and again, come to some uh, conclusions. So how it all started, um, I have to introduce a, a bit um, the new psychoactive substances. Um, those are of you that are not in that field. Uh, this actually refers to substances uh, which mimic like the effects of conventional drugs. Think about stimulants uh, like amphetamines. Um, you have uh, psychedelics, you have cannabinoids, but they look different. And, and typically they are like, uh, yeah, really chemical synthesis, uh, chemically synthesized uh, compounds and belong to a wide variety of classes. Uh, what they have uh, in common is that is uh, is like a continuously changing uh, panel, quite often high potent, uh, highly potent drugs, um, which means that um, the concentrations which may be present in biofluids uh, can be really low. Traditional approaches uh, to find these drugs may uh, fail to detect these um, uh, new psychoactive substances. Because, for instance, if you think about drug, regular drug screening assays, like, for instance, the ones which are here being applied here in Australia, you have the roadside, roadside testing, where you look for, um, typically it will be here, cannabis, ecstasy, uh, methamphetamine, I don't know if it's here also, methamphetamine, uh, it, it was in, in, in the south, I know in, in Sydney there's some cocaine, but um, uh, that's pretty much a Sydney thing, I heard. Uh, but um, Actually, you, you're just looking at those drugs, uh, not, not at all. So, so um, you won't see those. Um, it's quite difficult to keep mass spectral libraries up to date uh, because um, if I go back to the graph here, um, for instance, in 2015, there's like something like 100 new compounds that entered the recreational drug market in 2015, meaning that's two, two new drugs every week. Now this is down to something like one drug then every week, one new recreational drug every week. But as this is an additive thing, this is this is still quite substantial. Now we are about um, at this point over roughly over a thousand new psychoactive substances that have evolved since 25. And um, there's also limitations um, um, uh, if you don't go, if you don't look, uh, uh, let's say, using mass spectral libraries, but uh, non-targeted. There are ways, uh, for instance. Um, non-targeted to high resolution MS uh, screening is possible, but that typically still requires a threshold in order to trigger an acquisition. So the signal needs to be high enough and only then actually an acquisition will be uh, triggered. If you are dealing with highly active compounds, which are really present at very low concentrations, it may just be, yeah, it may just be below the threshold in order to trigger an acquisition uh, in order to be picked up via non-targeted screening. So that's why already almost 10 years ago, I uh, had the idea, let's uh, let's try something so different and rather than looking at the at sort, of, sort of the physical presence of a substance, uh, can we look at the activity of a substance? So like for instance here, there's a, a wide variety of synthetic cannabinoids, that kind of receptor agonists um, that are shown, and uh, they uh, can all uh, uh, have in, they all have in common that they act on uh, one given receptor, the cannabinoid one uh, receptor, which is why persons take this drug in order to be under the influence of, of, of cannabinoids. And actually, um, we uh, combined uh, this um, 
uh, receptor um, uh, yeah, binding principle uh, with uh, so-called nanolysophrase uh, technology. Okay, uh, so we combine this with a nanolysophrase enzyme technology where we actually can um, split an enzyme uh, between a blue part and a red part, so two inactive parts. I'll show that in, in uh, more detail in the next slide. Uh, so, and so like that, uh, we can come to a... Um, <laughs> it's quite funny. <laughs> we can we can come to a, um, a luminescence-based uh, assay. So the principle not only holds true for the cannabinoid receptor, uh, but we can also apply that uh, for other receptors. And in, in short, actually, the ones of you that may have children that uh, are, uh, are fans of uh, penguins of, uh, of Madagascar, and there's a saying in there, famous saying by Skipper um, that says, uh, looks don't matter, it's what you do that counts. And if you can actually recall the second part of my presentation like that, because it doesn't matter what a compound looks like, it's what it does that counts. If it binds to uh, the cannabinoid receptor and activates the cannabinoid receptor, that's what we will measure. And this not, does, not only hold, does not only hold true for the cannabinoid receptor, but also for the mu opiate receptor and for the serotonin 2A receptor, which uh, uh, serves as a receptor for psychedelics. So we set up um, um, assay systems for all these different types of uh, receptors. So um, the assay principle and protocol, I won't go into too much detail. We work with living cells, so it's quite different from the bioanalytical uh, workflow, uh, which have been uh, genetically engineered uh, by us. And um, we have introduced the mu opioid receptor or the cannabinoid receptor one or two, or the serotonin receptor hooked to one part of an analysis phrase. And there's then a signal transaction molecule hooked to another part of the analysis phrase. And the analysis phrase actually uh, depicted over here. So the blue and the red by themselves are inactive. However, if the red inserts, as to say, uh, in uh, in the blue, um, you have a functional re complementation, functional reconstitution of the activity uh, of the nanolysis phrase. So what happens if a substance binds to the receptor? You get a conformational change. This leads to a recruitment of the signal transaction molecule. And like that, the blue and red become into to close proximity, the red is integrated in the blue, and uh, this can easily be monitored by luminescence. So that's the principle that we uh, apply. Good, um, this is the how the assay works. Um, we work in 96 well plates, then the assay procedure. Uh, in a sense, it comes down to the fact that we uh, add test solutions. Uh, this could be biological extract or reference standards. Um, and then we have a readout of two hours. Um, so we can look at multiple samples. So within this readout of two hours, actually for, for real samples, we already get the result within 30 minutes. Um, some applications. Um, first of all, screening, because that's how the idea initially started. Um, rather than looking um, um, analytically uh, to what's present in a biological sample, can we uh, do this um, uh, via activity-based um, uh, via an activity-based assay? Um, make a long story short, yes, several publications preceded uh, the work uh, shown over here. This is already where we are at this stage. Um, so we collaborated with um, the hospital in London because they got quite some recreational drug um, overdoses. And um, 968 plasma samples were analyzed by us or uh, by a group uh, with uh, whom they collaborated that looked with a dedicated procedure for synthetic, synthetic cannabinoids using high resolution MS. Uh, we worked uh, blind coded, uh, just got samples and said, okay, this is a positive, this is a negative. Uh, that's uh, how it uh, worked. We didn't know about the number of positives and so on. Um, this is uh, what we eventually got. Um, true positives, um, true negatives, and then some false negative false positives. In a sense, came down to sensitivity of 94.6, specificity of 98.5%. Why isn't this, um, so this is actually pretty good for a screening test. Why isn't it perfect? There are some samples uh, that contain trace levels of um, synthetic cannabinoids, not really enough to be physiologically relevant, you could say, but still. They were present. So those were samples which were scored positive by the high resolution MS and that we had missed because there was not enough activity uh, present. So really low trace levels we won't find. Specificity isn't 100% um, because in some instances we had uh, like a small bump and it was like 
yeah, would it be positive or not? And then we then we were on the cautious side and said, okay, this is like a, to be applied as a screening approach. Let's consider it a positive, and then eventually it turned out to be a bit of variation on on the blank. Um, um, there was two samples where we got like a substantial signal. Um, However, there was, uh, and we, we are quite confident that they actually are positives, um, but they weren't confirmed via high resolution MS. There wasn't sample again anymore to do the high resolution MS again. Uh, so we'll never know how it is. We are, yeah, um, but we also called those false positives because it's screening assay and we consider the high resolution MS as the gold standard. So if it's not confirmed, we call it a false positive. Although in some kind of way, we are quite sure it was positive. <laughs> We didn't only do uh, scoring of profiles like this uh, by ourselves. Uh, here, this is like a, a clear positive one. This is how a negative profile look, would look like. Um, um, we also had computer-based um, um, scoring. And actually, the good news for my PhD student was that she still outperformed uh, the computer. So this was like a machine learning approach. Uh, you learn the computer how to recognize a positive profile. And um, uh, certainly in the specificity, the, uh, com yeah, the computer um, actually um, yeah, scored yeah scored these more easily a positive than we uh, than we were like the human eye was apparently still better, uh, but it, this comes down to training. So we should uh, insert more positives in order so uh, to train uh, the the computer in a better way. Good. Um, screening is also suited for uh, opioids. I didn't include that um, for the sake of time. It's not uh, suited for uh, psychedelics, uh, primarily uh, because of this. I am. Cert psychedelics work on serotonin A receptor. If we look at blank uh, plasma extracts, we get a positive result in uh, every plasma or, ble or also every urine sample. That's uh, simply because serotonin is present in plasma or in urine. Um, we could also demonstrate that if we um, block if we block the receptor with a close up in, uh, we can bring this uh, signal down. Also, uh, serotonin by itself uh, gives a dose uh, or concentration dependent response in our assay. There are ways to get rid of uh, serotonin by treating the sample um, an extract with a monoamine oxidase, which is also uh, the enzyme that degrades serotonin in the human body. Uh, but also some psychedelics uh, will be degraded by this enzyme. So we would end up with a procedure which looks at part of the psychedelics. For instance, LSD would still be, uh, LSD positivity would still be uh, recognized because LSD is, is not a substrate of Mao, but part not, uh, part wouldn't be recognized. So a semi-universal approach doesn't, doesn't exist. Um, we do have a universal screening for opioids, a universal screening for, um, uh, for cannabinoids, but for the serotonin 2A receptor, it can't be used as a screening uh, tool. Good. Uh, looking at structure activity uh, relationships is important because of this uh, continuously evolving um, market with continuously changing structures. And typically, one structure is based on another one that may be highly uh, active. So we also embarked upon that. But before going to that, I'll um, introduce uh, some terms which are typically used in pharmacological research because that's in a sense what this is. Uh, uh, what this is. So we're looking at the maximum extent of receptor activation that's being referred to as the efficacy. Um, so the higher the uh, top of the curve, the higher, the more efficacious the compound is. For instance, here we can see that fentanyl is more efficacious than morphine. The more to the left um, um, the curve is, and, and if you look then at the 50% of the maximum efficacy, yeah, this is being referred to as the potency or the EC50 uh, value. But the more to the left, the more potent uh, a compound is. So, so meaning that the curve goes up at lower concentrations uh, already. So for instance, also here you can see that uh, fentanyl uh, is, being, is uh, scored as uh, more potent than morphine, something which we are all uh, aware of. The efficacy uh, is also somewhat linked to the harm potential, uh, the potency, and then uh, the lower the concentration the need, uh, needed to obtain the effects, uh, the higher the potency. Knowledge of these uh, uh, parameters um, should allow to direct and actually prioritize uh, control measures. So we are in contact with uh, UNODC, with EMCDDA, with, uh, with various other labs um, uh, in order to um, share our information uh, so that they have um, very early on knowledge about uh, what the activities are of the newest uh, compounds um, so that they are prepared when these compounds are, are uh, present uh, on the market. Just one example that we worked on, the so-called uh, nitazine to benzyl benzimidazole uh, opioids. 
uh, many of these uh, new psychoactive substances actually aren't new. Um, this is very well exemplified by this one. Actually, these are already published in the 50s and the 60s, the majority of those. And uh, then um, nothing happened. And in the end, in 2019, isotonitazine was found in, in Belgium. Now, this is an internationally scheduled uh, compound, so also uh, following on, on our work and quite some deaths uh, in, in the US and elsewhere. And obviously, if something gets scheduled, what happens? Then you get a whole range of other compounds uh, which um, uh, enter uh, the market. So there's quite some of these nitazines uh, which are now uh, present on the market. This can be um, yeah, categorized uh, depending on uh, how uh, they look like over here, here, or here. And so we can do structure activity relationships on, on those. Just um, one example, uh, isotonitazine, is, uh, its uh, name comes uh, from the iso, uh, isopropyl group, uh, which is over here. There's also metonitazine, which has a methyl or methoxy group, uh, etonitazine, etoxy, proto, and butonitazine, propyl and butyl uh, group. And so then uh, if you do um, structure activity relationship um, determination, you can see that the sweet spot is um, actually here, the ethyl group, because this is the uh, etonitazine, which is most to the left and the highest one. Isotonitazine is uh, still quite active, but for instance, butonitazine, which has here this longer butyl tail, has a lower uh, activity. So like that, uh, we can really uh, see which compounds are probably most harmful. Quite relevant um, because um, actually now and going in the US, um, there's um, uh, surfacing of uh, a metabolite, endazetyl isotonitazine. And already quite some time ago, we demonstrated that this endazetyl isotonitazine has a really high intrinsic uh, activity. So it's a metabolite of isotonitazine. Um, and now it's being marketed as such. Um, it's actually even more active than isotonitazine. So uh, obviously, from a supplier perspective, it's interesting because you can uh, yeah you can avoid uh, legislation. It's not isotonitazine; it's a metabolite, um, and it's still really uh, highly uh, active. We've also now done in vivo studies already with uh, this compound in collaboration with uh, NIDA, the group of Mike Bauman, and show that it's uh, also in vivo really potent. So it does get uh, through the blood-brain barrier. And actually, in the US, there's now several fatalities uh, being reported um, now in December and. January uh, this year with uh, endosetyl isotonitazine. Several alerts have already been already uh, sent out. I'm not sure about Australia, but it uh, has been seen here already. So you can wonder, okay, what you do in vitro, um, to what extent is that relevant for the in vivo uh, situation? Because that's in a sense what, what matters. Um, we worked on a compound, etonitazepine, or n pyrolidino etonitazine. In a sense, it's like isotonitazine uh, or etonitazine with um, uh, closed ring structure over here. So rather than having two ethyls, this is like a pyrolidino ring. <coughs> Still really active. So um, if you compare uh, with um, fentanyl, I think most of you will be convinced that fentanyl is like a strong opioid. Then uh, if you look at n pyrolidino etonitazine, it's quite leftwards of um, um, uh, fentanyl, up to 40 times more potent than uh, fentanyl. So fentanyl, as compared to, to etinidazepine, is a relatively weak uh, opioid. Um, this is not related to the mu opioid receptor binding. They all bind to the receptor, fentanyl, morphine, and, and pyrodino etonitazine, actually all in a quite similar uh, way. Um, and, but if, if you then look in the in vivo situation, then you can again see morphine over here, um, um, fentanyl over here, and here, etinidazepine or et enpirolidino etonitazine. This is a hot plate latency uh, assay for um, uh, for rats. And in a sense, it comes down to the fact that uh, if they are uh, under the influence of this uh, opioid, they uh, can stand the heat of a hot plate uh, for a longer time. And obviously, that's a maximum with a maximum of 45 seconds. Then they're taken off in order so that they don't burn uh, their paths. Uh, but that's, an, that's a, like a typical assay, how you can look at the opioid uh, effects. Another example in vitro versus in vivo is looking at overdose uh, cases and the concentrations that you get in overdose cases. And we did this for this uh, series of uh, compounds um, and collaborated with uh, uh, Central Forensic Science and Research Education in the, in the US. Um, and um, there they had um, a series of cases uh, with here this uh, green compound, 2-methyl AP237, and uh, um, with this uh, purple compound, AP238. And you can see that the curve for the purple one slides is slightly more left uh, uh, to the left 
and then the curve uh, to the green. And so this also corresponds to the fact that the concentrations uh, that were found in postmortem cases were slightly lower for the purple one, the more potent one, than for the green one, uh, which is more to the right, so slightly less uh, potent. So this also matched with actually our expectation from the in vitro uh, data. So the, these postmortem concentrations, which were found in these uh, casualties. It also works for psychedelics. Um, uh, this is like a 2CX compound uh, concentration response curves. Uh, if you um, uh, modify to DUX, uh, you can see a slight lift, uh, a slight shift to the left, to the uh, to the left, um, and uh, slightly upwards. So a bit more potent, a bit more efficacious. Um, and BOMI uh, compounds uh, look like this, and you can see these are also really well known to be more efficacious and more potent. Um, several, several fatalities have been occur have been occurring with these and uh, compounds. So we can also really see that in our assay. If more, uh, if we look at the recommended uh, dosages of these uh, compounds in dedicated websites like Pichal, Erowit, uh, Psychonaut Wiki, um, and we plot uh, those versus what we got in our assay as EC50s, uh, then we got the 2CX compounds over here, slightly to uh, lower doses um, and lower EC50s and DOX compounds, and again, lower EC50s and, and uh, lower doses, um, these uh, um, are more potent and BOMI uh, compounds. This is LSD, and then there's also some uh, other uh, less, um, um, yeah, so, so some some less psychoactive compounds or so of compounds for which you need to um, uh, use more in order to uh, have the um, uh, psychedelic experience, DOH and mescaline. So again, also this matched uh, higher doses required, and we also find higher uh, EC50s in our assay. So all in all, the, we got a pretty good uh, correlation, also indicating that for the psychedelics, we can really um, um, actually get a correlation with this uh, um, um, psychedelic uh, capability of these compounds. Um, one last example for um, the in vitro versus um, um, uh, in vivo or here ex vivo application, synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists. Uh, so we collaborated again with a London hospital and worked on a cohort of 71 patients in which the only synthetic cannabinoid was 5 fluoro mdv pica or its metabolites. And actually what we wanted to do is, uh, so we have the concentration, we, uh, we collaborated with a group that determined the concentrations uh, uh, in these, um, uh, of this uh, scra in uh, plasma of these patients. And what we also had was the in vivo uh, the the, um, the in vitro activity uh, just using pure reference standards of 5 fluoro mdv pica and the different metabolites. And so we reasoned would it be possible that knowledge of the uh, concentration on the one hand in vivo, knowledge of the intrinsic activity of these reference standards um, could be combined this and sort of predict what the activity would be in the plasma of these of these patients, um, and this in um, this in the end worked. So, long story short, concentrations in vitro activity of these uh, of these reference uh, compounds, and then we also looked at the serum extracts from these uh, individuals, and also looked at the activity with our activity based assay uh, in these uh, serum extracts. And so, if we uh, then plotted uh, this. We could see that uh, if we have here the SCRA concentration, so 5 fluid and the PICA concentration, and we plot this uh, versus uh, or area under the curve uh, referring to our activity assay, that's the uh, observed activity, which is depicted here in black, um, pretty well matched with what we predicted just based on concentration and the in vitro activity of the reference compounds. So in other words, we can predict what the activity is in someone's serum and, and uh, to what extent there is so someone is really experiencing this uh, synthetic cannabinoid uh, effects. So this is another way of representing uh, this. So you can see it's not a perfect correlation, but pretty well um, uh, that we could uh, predict uh, what the activity would, uh, would be. Good. Um, study of seized powders, um, another relevant um, uh, thing. Um, uh, sometimes we get uh, seized powders uh, because uh, Belgium um, uh, serves as a hub for certain transportation companies. Uh, so um, samples or packages are being uh, um, being flied in, and then they're being redistributed there, and then they go elsewhere uh, to Europe. So it's a, a good place uh, in order to uh, encounter interesting packages. And like, for instance, here, this is an example of um, BZO, Forian, Poxizit, these are all horrible names. Actually, this is a China ban evading synthetic cannabinoids. So what happens is um, 
Many of these compounds uh, are synthesized in, in China, um, and this is not, um, it's sometimes quite often referred to as illicit manufacture, but it isn't. This is completely illicit manufacture. These are just chemical compounds, chemical, chemical uh, manufacturers that happen to synthesize compounds um, which have cannabinoid effects or which are 40 times more potent than fentanyl. Um, uh, but it's completely legal, so it's not, they're not illegal. So this is actually a, a compound that evaded um, uh, legislation because uh, China has set, out, uh, set up legislation, for instance, to, uh, yeah, with uh, different, uh, I think, seven, seven different uh, synthetic cannabinoid receptor generic structures. So if you have a series of generic structures, what do you do? You look, how can I yeah, modify a compound so that it doesn't fall under this generic legislation that I have a legit uh, synthesis. So this was done over here. We got powder, put in our assays, and actually saw a pretty good overlay with the commercial reference and the seized powder. Here, actually, you can almost don't, you almost don't see that it's like two curves. Um, and quite often they do a good job. So what we get is like almost like reference material. Not always. Um, not always um, we get the, the correct uh, thing. It's like here, purity was supported by analytical data. Um, here, an opioid. Uh, we published on that uh, some time ago. MT45 derivative. To put into context, this is how fentanyl looks like. It shows some resemblance uh, to uh, to fentanyl. And then different people all show some resemblance to this uh, MT45. So we got some powder. We applied it in our assay, and just for reference, this is fentanyl over here. And we had to apply quite a, quite a high concentrations of this uh, different pipanol sample that we got, and actually it was less active than we uh, anticipated. Um, a very long story short, uh, it wasn't different pipanol, it was actually an isomer of different pipanol, uh, rather than the hydroxy group being here. It was uh, over here, which we then explained why it had only a weak uh, activity. Um, we had published this, and uh, just shortly after, I got, a, I got an email uh, from uh, someone saying, I saw a recent paper. For several years, I've been in regular contact with the owner of the vendor responsible for organizing production of this particular chemical. They were unaware they had been provided with this incorrect chemical. I was unintentional for it to be mislabeled. So sort of, uh, my apologies. Um, and actually, um, there's uh, only ever one batch made due to several user reports of it having no apparent opioid activity. So actually the users also um, yeah, had the same conclusion like we had, it's a really weak uh, opioid. Um, anyone can send this email, um, you may think, uh, just, just for fun. Uh, you can see that there's two attachments. Um, the, the attachments were actually the NMR profile and the high-resolution MS profile, which did match with our NMR and high-resolution MS profile. So it was um, an isomer, I said, so the high-resolution MS mass was the same. Was, uh, so they thought it was the correct one. The NMR profile was also quite similar, and also we had to team up with uh, medicinal chemists that really are, are really into, into, uh, into that. Um, and um, yeah, like that, they could figure out it was an isomer, uh, which isomer it was, and that it was the, and that it was the wrong uh, one. So a nice, yeah, nice story to really um, yeah, to get feedback, actually, uh, in, uh, like that. Good, I come to the last uh, um, uh, part, uh, a case report, and again, uh, it ends with some uh, feedback. Um, we had in Ghent, uh, Ghent University Hospital, someone uh, presented with uh, muscle pain, nausea, cramping, and diarrhea. Um, and actually, no, it was, uh, it was he wasn't presented to the hospital. Actually, he was uh, presented to his uh, general practitioner. But the sample then was sent to the hospital, and he seeked help for detoxification. And he said, I'm using a yeah, product which is um, uh, being referred to as etonitazepipni or npipridinyl etonitazine. So it, rather than a five-ring structure, it's a six-ring structure uh, here. So there's many variations that you can apply. And uh, what we did, we got um, some plasma sample from this um, individual, and we measured the opioid activity in that sample. And so this is what we got. Uh, so it was uh, clearly different from a blank, so substantial opioid activity present in the sample. We also quantified um, uh, pipni in the sample, and this was uh, 1.2 nanogram per mil. Um, then, yeah, the question obviously is um, 1.2 nanogram per mil pipni. what does that mean? There's no one on earth that knows what that means. Would that be a lot? Would that be, wouldn't that be a lot? It's, it's really hard uh, to tell. Um, actually, we figured a way uh, how we can tell if that's a lot or not, because if we yeah, plot fentanyl the same way uh, in, in uh, uh, serum or plasma, we can uh, get a concentration-dependent uh, response. And if we then make a comparison uh, with uh, this etunidaz pipni sample, uh, we got uh, this result. So actually, we can say that the activity contained within this uh, sample from this patient is between 5 and 10 nanogram per milliliter. 
which is quite high. Any of us uh, which isn't the pain patient um, uh, would be dead uh, with a concentration between 5 and 10 nanogram per milliliter. This guy was just having a chat with his uh, GP about his, um, yeah, his feeling unwell because he had in gastrointestinal problems. But he, um, um, he was actually really on uh, quite a while on this itinazepipni, which is a really strong uh, uh, opioid similar to uh, fentanyl. And again, um, it was nice uh, to get uh, feedback in some kind of way, uh, because um, most of these cases end up in, in a coffin, don't go to their general practitioner, because sadly, it's quite, uh, quite often overdoses. And uh, this is someone that's uh, on Reddit. Um, we are also on Reddit, my students uh, are on Reddit. Uh, and actually here, uh, this um, uh, guy posted, was extremely addicted to epiphany in doses that were pretty much insane. Um, he finally gained enough courage to go to his doctor, um, gave a sample of his uh, eternal spitney to his doctor who got it analyzed, and a professor made a PubMed uh, paper about it. Google first identification it as Pipney, you get the article. And uh, he actually was complaining anything else. So he said uh, they actually did a great job identifying it and analyzing the more activity equivalents to morphine, etc. And um, oh, hope still doing fine. Uh, the, the day he posted this was his first day without an opiate since a year uh, and a half uh, ago. Good. Um, so with this, I come to uh, my uh, conclusions. Um, if we uh, look at the uh, activity-based assays, then um, actually they were started uh, because of the increasing complexity of the new psychoactive substances markets. Um, they look at receptor activation, so it's a different way of looking at um, um, these uh, NPSs. They allow um, universal detection of opioids and cannabinoid receptor agonists. And actually, we're in a stage that we are capable of ruling out the relevant presence of cannabinoids or opioids in forensic cases. Importantly, we, we can also monitor the presence of uh, opioid antagonists. Uh, so we also have an assay that allows to do that. It's a screening assay, so confirmation is still required. So um, in any sample that we get, um, we yeah we can actually uh, we already got several samples like that like someone someone presents and it's like we think it's like an opioid death but we don't find anything could you have a look and then we can actually rule out oh indeed there's no opioid uh, involved and um, activity based characterization allows prioritization early risk assessment so we are in contact uh, with several instances provide our information to these um, 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 uh, to these instances uh, and. Um, we can only do this because of global and multidisciplinary partnerships uh, that may allow this prioritization in order to help to combat the NPS problem. Certainly, for instance, with these new synthetic opioids, there's no way that we can deal with those in a responsible way. They're so potent, two points. Uh, so there's no way uh, to um, uh, to sort of, yeah, we'll, we'll structure that in some uh, kind of way. Good. With this, I've come to the end of my presentation. I want to thank uh, my entire team, also my previous uh, PC students, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Gustav. Um, I, for those that don't know, my field is the microsampling, and it's such a good opportunity. I wouldn't normally sit through forensic toxicology, so such a, an interesting field for me. Um, now, I'm just going to jump online in case anyone has any questions. And then we can take some from the room as well. Uh, so if anyone online wants to drop something into the chat, feel free. Um, and until you do, I'll see if there's... Is there anyone in the room who's got any questions for Crystal? Yeah. Fire yeah, um, I was, I was going to ask if you managed to get any microsampling into the routine. Is then you showing the pet? Mm -hmm. and the GHP, right? yeah. Um, so that's quite an achievement, I imagine. Um, the PEP is on a band device. The, the, the other one, is that band or DPS or? Yeah. Um, so for the ones online, so the question is about GHB and, and, and PET and, and uh, using it in, in a real routine application. So we have both accredited procedures for that. Um, the GHB is on dry bots, uh, spot filter paper, uh, where we apply uh, it actually uh, volumetrically on, on paper. So this is yeah the background of, of the, all the microsampling that, that we do was actually um, started with GHB and GCMS based analysis. And we have an on, on spot derivatization of um, the sample, which is actually volumetrically applied on, on a filter paper. So actually we don't just use that for 
um, for blood, but actually also for urine. Uh, urine, we just may spot a small volume of GHB, and, and like it's part of a sample prep, actually. Yeah. So, do you have a, a go to micro sample? Yes, you both. No, um, I, we are quite, quite uh, sometimes get that question, like also from, from vendors. Uh, why don't you only use our device? Um, and I say we're not hooked to, to any company, so we collaborate with almost all companies. Um, um, there's you know, different advantages and, and, and disadvantages that come with, uh, with some, like for instance, the cards. Um, they have the advantage that they're fully automatable at this point. At this point, the, for instance, the Mitra tips, uh, the VAMS tips for metric absorptive microsampling tips um, aren't uh, fully automatable. Uh, we are, we have plans to do that as well. Um, but still, then price may also to, uh, be um, be an aspect that uh, comes into uh, comes into play. Uh, like the clinical field is a price sensitive field where the cards uh, may be a cheaper option than if you go to more dedicated uh, devices uh, where that require more um, yeah more tools, more more sophistication in order to to produce uh, them. Um, the uh, uh, let's say the context in which you want to envisage uh, the sampling is also important. For instance, um, in my experience, these, these Mitra tips uh, that, uh, call, that wick up a fixed volume of blood are slightly easier uh, because you're so you're looking at the drop of blood and it it yeah you see the tip becoming red rather than if you have to prepare a, a blood spot and um, then the drop is hanging and it should be big enough uh, be, uh, yeah, before you touch the paper and actually you shouldn't be touching the paper with your hand and certainly for older people that are shaking a bit it's more difficult so once you are, are used to generating dry blood spots it's yeah it's simple uh, but for a first time user these new devices and that's actually also why they are there uh, may may offer a benefit to yeah uh, to allow more easy collection of a good sample so it all depends on the question and the context. Anyone else in the room? Yeah, question. Karen? Um, I was interested from a CD's from perspective and the way you looked at that case to the comparative amounts of this was a lot of like five or ten milligrams. If you have proteins and mixtures, say in cancer tablets, are you able to get some indication from your frequency data of what the coupons that would have to amount of patients in the same? Yeah, the question is about uh, opioid mixtures that may be present in tablets. Um, and that's actually that's what we are doing now. Um, so we now Yesterday evening, still, I, I uh, read some, yeah, uh, let's say paper that's uh, to be submitted uh, from it's uh, dealing with uh, synthetic cannabinoids, uh, where we have, um, let's say, a powder, uh, which um, uh, primarily contains, um, um, again, a China ban evading uh, synthetic cannabinoids, uh, uh, CHPATA. You may, yeah, I don't know if you heard about it. And so we have the reference standard, we have the powder. The powder contains more than 80% CHP out but also several impurities. And actually we compared the, the activity of the powder with that of the reference standard. And the powder has a higher activity than the reference standards. And probably there's like traces of other synthetic cannabinoids. We didn't really find the, the, the identity of those, uh, but there's traces of other synthetic cannabinoids present that contribute to the activity. And the same holds true uh, for, uh, for instance, this uh, endazetyl uh, isotonitazine, um, uh, which is being seen in the US. It's been seen together with um, uh, some fentanyl and some, and some other compounds, which are in these, in these counterfeit uh, uh, tablets. And what we can actually really do is look at the, let's say, the opioid, the total opioid activity, which is uh, present in there. And we've proposed um, that we can um, express it as, um, for instance, for, for opioids, as fentanyl equivalents, uh, you could serve um, for the kind of synthetic cannabinoids. We've quite um, uh, we've used quite a bit of GWH18 as a reference, and there we were, we're referring to GWH18 equivalents, uh, because again, that 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 makes sense because again, the the, the the composition of these um, of these counterfeit tablets, which contain a certain amount of whatever nitazine, that yeah, whether they contain one or ten milligram, that that doesn't say anything. But it does say a thing if you can say, okay, this is like equivalent to so many uh, to that um, uh, so many milligrams uh, 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 of uh, fentanyl. Yeah. Can I follow up on that? Uh, because I'm also more interested in uh, was wondering a little bit how you 
bring in the efficacy into the potency because I mean if you have different efficacies then you go to a different time. Indeed, it, it is like that. Um, uh, we, we've also shown that uh, now recently for psychedelics, we've done that. Uh, if you combine a partial agonist uh, with a full uh, with a full agonist, indeed, uh, you will uh, sort of, yeah, uh, that, that partial agonist, uh, if it has a high affinity, the receptor may compete with the full agonist and you may end up with um, a lower, yeah, lower efficacy. But that's also what will happen in vivo. If someone takes um, um, takes these pills, also this partial uh, agonist. Uh, think, for instance, about the uh, yeah, buprenorphine, um, which is a partial agonist. Um, that that will also um, have a, a, a lower receptor activating maximum uh, in in vivo. Um, obviously, it, we cannot fully predict what will happen in vivo uh, because it also depends on metabolization and um, uh, that will take place um how absorption um uh, how the absorption of the of this these different compounds uh, will take place um to what extent they both get uh, through the blood brain uh, barrier so that will have an impact as well but um the composition and and the mixture um in, in the pill will also be like a mixture in the in the human body so in some kind of way it's still relevant that we yeah that uh, we would in some kind of we have an interference of one uh, with the other as this will also take place in vivo but let me just compare the potency of different chemicals or even how you describe it uh relative potency equivalency for a mm -hmm. normalized yep. fentanyl, for example. And then when fentanyl has an efficacy that is double as high as morphine, how does that go into the potency, the relative potency measurement? Because technically, if you would normalize it to morphine, you only have to get to a quarter of the fentanyl total efficacy to compare relative potency. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. So what's what's happening in vivo is a combination of both. Uh, it's it's both efficacy and potency. And actually, what we look at, the yeah, in in really concrete uh, terms, is um, so we have uh, to set up these curves. We look at um, the yeah, luminescence uh, actually. So the, we look at an area under the curve, and uh, so um, we look really at the combined the combined thing of efficacy and potency. And and it's only yeah, we only get to the efficacy and potency values uh, because we use different uh, concentrations. But if you have, like have a certain preparation, a certain drug preparation, then we have a certain dilution that we apply, and then we end up with a certain area on the curve, and we can compare that with the same area on the curve like I did for that patient um, um, on, yeah, on, uh, yeah, on, on reference uh, standards. So it's, it sort of doesn't even doesn't matter what uh, composition is, and we now also recently demonstrated that for, uh, it's another paper, it's on, it's on brominated synthetic cannabinoids. Um, um where actually we did we did actually do the experiment with different mixtures because they were found in scottish prisons in different mix in different compositions always like a mixture and uh we did uh, 20 80 percent uh 50 50 80 20 and then both uh zero percent one or, or um zero percent the other and we can really see that the yeah because they, they had two had uh, they had different potencies and we could really see the curve of these mixtures shift uh, from left to right, uh, depending on how we changed the mixture, because we actually were also wondering what will uh, what will happen, and it depends on the molar composition. If you have a partial agonist, uh, which is present and a higher molar amount than a uh, full agonist, it will it will bring the curve down. It will bring the efficacy down because yeah, because it's a partial agonist and it competes with the full agonist. Yeah. So the application of the bioassay, uh, where does it uh, where does it lie? Um, actually. I see it, it could have a potential in, in like big labs uh, that have to screen many, uh, many samples. So, or for instance, also in contexts where uh, many ceased, uh, many ceased samples uh, arrive, where you get where you get a, a rapid idea about uh, yeah what's um, what, what's present in there. Because sometimes you can also have really really dangerous mixtures. Like you may think, oh, this is like 
Um, yeah, this is like uh, uh, cannabinoids, but there could be uh, yeah slightly uh, a tiny amount of these nitazines present, which makes it a deadly uh, actually a deadly mixture. Like there's also co uh, cocaine uh, mixtures with already some synthetic opioids. Uh, so the application in large labs um, and, and in that context and uh, really for this risk prioritization. So now actually we're at the stage where we are predicting what the next opioids uh, will be. So we sort of try to make the reasoning uh, that Chinese manufacturers um, uh, will make. We have done this uh, for uh, nitazines. Um, I can later say <laughs> which ones we already have, um, have, uh, have developed, uh, but we already have in vitro data, we have animal data, uh, and um, some, some of the prophetic, we call them prophetic nitazines, um, are actually coming. So I have um, intelligence from last week that one of the ones that we, one of the compounds that we predicted has now uh, appeared on the, um, on the market in the US. Uh, luckily, it's not active, not not really active. It's one of the most weakly active ones that we had predicted. Um, uh, but yeah, it's nice to see that what we predicted would come on the market has uh, has entered the market. Um, also, isomers. Uh, like I know you've been working here on uh, U10, alpha U10, beta U10. We've um, characterized those and, and seen that uh, alpha U10 is really poor in opioid activity. Beta U10 is um, um, as a as a good uh, opioid receptor activation potential because at, at this point uh, I know in the papers it's mentioned that it's not really well known. But so we've unpublished data uh, on that as well. And actually on all these new opioids which are being offered on websites um so we yeah we are on top of of uh, we are current with sort of everything and actually try to be ahead even what is the biological that because like based or yeah to like uh, so it can be applied on any biological sample, actually. Um, we've applied it already on blood, urine, uh, plasma, vitreous. Uh, one of the limitations, if you work on urine, uh, is, um, and we originally started from, started from urine um, um, because we figured that the concentrations would be higher and that would be like advantageous in order to make our assay work. But actually the assay worked better than we anticipated, so we could also go to plasma and, and, and blood and serum. Um, one of the limitations if you work with uh, urine is that um, we're looking at an activity-based assay. So if you have metabolites which are inactive, you again may miss, uh, may miss the compounds. Luckily, uh, for synthetic cannabinoids, uh, many synthetic cannabinoids um, are metabolized uh, via hydroxylations and so on. So uh, you still uh, have quite some activity which is being left. Typically, concentrations will also be higher. If you look at one of the newer generations, uh, synthetic cannabinoid receptor agonists, then there's quite some ester functions um, which are being um, uh, which are present there, or amide functions, which may be more easily hydrolyzed. This has a more higher impact on actually the structure, and there you get uh, like a 100 fold loss in activity, which is really substantial. So those metabolites are really weakly active. Luckily, there's always still other metabolites which are present. So in urine, we are lucky that we looking at the combined activity of everything which is present. So you may have five metabolites, two may be weakly active, uh, one may be relatively active, and one that it, does, it's, it may be sufficient that there's one which still has quite decent activity that we can still pick it up because we look at really the combined activity of everything, which is one of the advantages as well. It's not commercially available, so it's something we developed in in house. Um, it's yeah, in theory, it would be commercial. Yeah, it would yeah, could be commercializable. Uh, back then, when I uh, when we set this up, um, I went to the Ghent University Technical Transfer Office and asked, uh, okay, do you think this is something which which could be yeah patentable, whatever? They said no. The idea is too simple because yeah, you're looking at an opioid and you're looking at an opioid activity, so. It's yeah, but still no one else did it. We're still at this point the only one that that really do this, uh, looking at in biological uh, samples. Um, yeah, but in, in theory, uh, yeah, anyone could uh, in theory anyone could set, uh, set could set this up because everything has also been published. Uh, so when we figured out uh, that they said no, oh, it's not commercializable, we didn't need to wait for publications and so on. And so we could just uh, uh, everything is out there. So. Well, that's question. But anyway, you still have to confirm the. Yeah. 
So it's yeah, it's yeah. We still have to confirm. So it's not replacing. That's a very important reason we're not replacing. Uh, let's say analytical methodologies, but you can cut down. Certainly, like I said, I was referring to big labs. For instance, suppose you have labs with a with a massive throughput, so like like there are some labs in the US uh, where you may have thousand samples per day that you need to screen for opioids or synthetic opioids. Um, and then you can just say, okay, I'll uh, apply these thousand samples in um, uh, in these formats. So we, we run these in 300, in, in 96 well format, uh, 96 well plates, but you could also run this in 384 well plates and you could say three uh, 384 well plates that covers thousand samples. Uh, and then you can um, um, have an idea about, for instance, the 50 samples which are there, which have a relevant opioid activity and for the 950 ones uh, that don't that uh, that uh, don't give anything, you can say, okay, I don't need to bother looking uh, for synthetic opioids there because there's no relevant, let's say, biologically relevant uh, opioid activity in there. There could still be traces that don't trigger the uh, the receptor uh, activation, uh, but that's typically what they're not interested in because they're in quite often looking in, in really toxicologically relevant uh, cases. Um, um, I was already elaborating briefly on the fact that um, antagonists can also be found. So the way we do that is during the while our assay is running, we actually add a small amount of agonists to the sample, and then every blank sample gives yeah should give a bump. And actually, we did that because we had to do that because we got quite some samples from the US, and we encountered some, several negatives in which there were. Um, yeah, actually opioids present, and it's because quite in quite some instances naloxone has been administered, so naloxone is the uh, antidote uh, for an opioid overdose, and uh, quite, in, quite often too, administered too late, so people die anyway. Um, uh, but naloxone is still present in, in, in the blood, and because we have an activity-dependent uh, assay, if naloxone is in the blood, it's co-extracted, um, and it also blocks our receptor system. And so we can uh, still see that by adding agonists um, while the assay is running. And so in every sample, we normally we get like this. Uh, and then if we add, it gives a bump because we have opioid, we induce opioid activity. If it just continues down, uh, it's like, okay, we add agonists and nothing happens. Uh, so there's antagonist presence. And so that sample is still uh, is also still flagged as um, a, a suspicious one because if naloxone is present, it must have been administered for a reason. So that would also be like a flagged sample. Okay, and thank you very much for everyone who joined us online.